going to talk about transport and full counting statistics within Juan Monte Carlo. Emmanuel, can you guys hear me? Uh, not too well. Could you please make it a little bit louder? Uh, I can try. Uh, yeah, but let's see if this, otherwise we mess up everything. Uh, if you just say something, guys. Can you hear me better now? Uh, say something again. I'm saying something again. I can uh, increase my speaker volume. Okay, no, that, that's good. Thank you. Okay, let's make sure Zoom doesn't turn it down. Ah, no, okay, there's a Zoom bug. Hold on, I think I know how to solve this. Um, but if you just go back to the presentation, uh, you should be okay. No, but it keeps uh, reducing the volume when I speak. So hold on. We, it's okay because we've locally, we've increased it. Uh, okay, fine. I, I may have to keep increasing it. Okay, well, I think it's okay now. Okay, so, uh, so is this good? Guys? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Thanks. So let's, let's just uh, go into it. Uh, these are my collaborators. Uh, and I'll start by uh, a, f a brief introduction to full counting statistics, which uh, Jean-Philippe just mentioned. Uh, but, but I'll give a little classical intro to this for those of you who don't uh, really have an idea of why that's interesting. So uh, let's, let's imagine for a moment that we have a faucet. If we have a really good and ideal faucet, and we have uh, some sort of uh, device for measuring the current through it, we expect that an ideal faucet would just have a constant current as a function of time. Uh, but even if your faucet is really perfect and you've eliminated all sources of error, uh, water is actually, uh, is actually made of particles. And that, that means that you're going to have some sort of noise if your detector is good enough. So the fact that you're measuring a current composed of distinct particles means that you will have some sort of noise in your measurement and that is called shot noise. So this was first uh, thought of by Schottky who was looking at, uh, at uh, vacuum tubes, just electrons coming out of vacuum tubes. And uh, what he worked out, what you can work out in just a few lines of algebra is that if uh, particle, uh, particle events, particle tunneling events or whatever you're measuring are uh, completely uncorrelated, they come from a Poisson distribution, then in a Poisson distribution, the variance is proportional to the, uh, to the mean, which is the current in this case. And you can find the proportionality constant, it's just uh, essentially the charge of the particle. Or in the case of water, the mass of a water particle, if you're measuring uh, current and mass units. So uh, actually by measuring not just the current, but also fluctuations in that current, you're able to find something out about the charge carriers that, uh, that generate that current. So this is quite interesting. Uh, and it's clear that that information is not just in the current alone. Now, if you go to the quantum case, just non-interacting quantum systems, then uh, you know for these uh, junction systems that uh, uh, people have just mentioned, uh, you have a Landauer formula. You can calculate the exact current for a non-interacting system. And you can modify that very slightly to get an expression for the noise. And that noise, even for a non-interacting quantum system, is already different from the classical uh, Poisson limit. Uh, it's actually always, the quantum noise is always suppressed compared to the classical limit. Uh, and it's only the same when uh, transmission goes to zero. Where it, when transition goes to one, actually the quantum noise is fully suppressed whereas the classical noise would be much larger. So, so this is quite well understood since the 90s uh, from the work of Levitov and Lesovic. Uh, and, uh, and it's nice, but what about interacting systems? So it, it turns out that actually uh, not that much is known. It's often very hard to calculate shot noise and it's certainly hard to calculate higher moments of, uh, of things like currents. Uh, but experiments actually do pretty well. So, okay, we just had a mention of, uh, of experiments in cold atoms. There are a few other things that have been done there. Here's an experiment with uh, carbon nanotube junctions, uh, which essentially try to go to uh, very weak voltages, very, very small currents, 
very low temperatures in order to get to a theoretical regime where you have a Fermi liquid uh, theory applying. And that was, uh, it's about the borderline of what the experiments could do. And then you have one theoretical result uh, here from uh, this paper. And uh, so, so this, this should be five thirds and everything else on this plot that you see, uh, I hope that you guys can see my mouse actually, uh, is uh, unavailable from theory. Well, there's, no, there's no good theory to calculate it. So that's, that's an interesting challenge. Uh, you can make it a little bit more difficult by thinking not just of current, but of full counting statistics. So you can uh, think of higher moments of the current or a change in population in one of the leads. Uh, and you can think of a generating function of all these moments uh, in terms of a counting field lambda. And if you know this uh, Z of lambda and T, then you actually know all the moments and you actually know uh, more than the moments because you can work out probability distributions for different kinds of events. So uh, a nice little classical example of why that's interesting uh, is uh, bus bunching. So you guys probably know that uh, if, if there's a route in a city, and you have a couple of buses going across it, and it takes time t to go across the route, then you would naively expect that putting two buses on it would mean that after a bus, bus just passed, you'd wait a time t over two, typically for the next bus. But in reality, if you've ever waited at a bus station, you know that you wait time t, and then two buses come right after the other. Uh, so you know, there, there's a pretty simple reason for that. The first bus picks up some patches, passengers, it waits because of that, then the second bus has less passengers to pick up, comes a little closer. So you get an effective, inter, uh, effective attractive interaction between buses mediated by the loading and unloading of passengers. And that means that very quickly you get a spike in the distribution, which is at uh, the later time t. And to actually see this, to actually analyze this, it's, uh, it's not quite enough to just look at the mean of the distribution. You really want to look at the probability distribution of the first bus arriving sometime after the uh, zeroth bus has left. Uh, and that, have, that is immediately available from full counting statistics as well as the second bus and so on. So, okay, I, I hope I convince you that this is sort of interesting. And now I, I will talk, uh, right? So, so we, we have a quite general method for solving for transfer properties of uh, quantum impurity models. I think I don't need to introduce these models here, but uh, think of maybe an Anderson model. Here's an Anderson model. And uh, our method is uh, quantum Monte Carlo in real time. Uh, normally people don't do this because it's a very bad idea to do it in a brute force way. You get what's called a dynamical sign problem. Uh, there are a lot of other ways to solve these problems like energy was mentioned. Uh, this has certain advantages. If you do get it to work, then it doesn't really depend on, uh, for instance, whether you're in equilibrium or not. Uh, it doesn't care very much about time dependent fields. So a lot of the things that are difficult in the wave function methods are quite easy here. So, okay, so what happens if you do this naively? Here's an Anderson model, uh, which you start, okay, it has four states and I'm plotting the probability of being in each state as a function of time, assuming you started in a magnetized state and assuming that at time zero, you couple your dot to the leads at some set of parameters. And what you can see is that you get a result, uh, but after a very short time, you get a lot of noise. Uh, the analysis you can do is to plot this noise on a log scale as a function of time, and then you can see an exponent. So the noise increases exponentially as a function of time. This exponent is a sign problem. It's how quantum Monte Carlo fails. And we have a method that uh, circumvents this, at least to some degree, at least at some parameters. Okay, it's not completely general, but it seems to be quite general. And this is what I'm going to talk about. So how does this work? Super briefly, because I don't have much time today. Uh, we do a Dyson expansion. Okay, in this case, we expand in the dot path hybridization, but one can expand in other things. Uh, so you have a Dyson series with, with lots of terms at different times. And then you write that as diagrams. So this, these are the diagrams of the hybridization expansion. And you have uh, this full line, uh, I really hope you guys can see my mouse, which is the uh, full propagator. So this is something like E to IHT averaged over the bath. You have this bear line, which is an analytically calculated thing. In this case, it's the decoupled problem. And you have a vertex, which in this case 
is an event where an electron is traveling between your dot and your beads. And you can expand a diagrammatic series for the full propagator instead of this, in, in terms of this bare propagator. And hybridization lines, which are sets of events where an electron goes in at one time, and goes back out at another time. And if you sum up all possible diagrams like this, you get the exact propagator. Okay, so if you do this naively, you get a sign problem. In inchworm Monte Carlo, what we do is we express this series for a long propagator, propagator over a long time interval, in terms of a propagator over a shorter time interval, a full propagator over a shorter time interval, and bare propagators. And it turns out that we can express a very efficient series in these terms by recycling information from a short time propagation. And by doing this, we can essentially evaluate very easily short time propagators and use them to construct uh, an easy expansion for evaluating propagators at uh, sequentially longer and longer times. And eventually we can get very long propagators which allow us to evaluate dynamics without a sign problem in many cases. So again, I won't go into this here, but uh, uh, Emmanuel is there and will probably be happy to explain it uh, over the next break. Okay, so uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, extensions beyond just uh, the simple Anderson model. So uh, the, th this is a hybridization expansion. So I start from the atomic limit and initially I solve just the impurity site by itself. So if that has n spins, I have two to the n uh, many body states on that. So it's exponential in the number of spins that I have, or it's uh, four to the number of uh, uh, spin half degenerate orbitals. So going from a single uh, Anderson impurity to a double Anderson impurity is a factor of four in the Hamiltonian. And that amounts, because we have uh, matrix products in this Hamiltonian in order to calculate things, that amounts to something like a factor of 64 in the calculation. But, uh, so, so that, that actually sounds quite bad, right? That, that sort of makes you want to give up because these calculations are a little bit expensive as, as it is, but uh, that is total brute force. So by having just say spin as a good quantum number, you can uh, reduce this to uh, the, the largest matrix you would have is six by six. And uh, furthermore, this is not actually the dominant contribution in this. So it actually seems like at least going to say two impurities or maybe three should be possible. Uh, we haven't done it yet, okay? What we have done is uh, this same thing in imaginary time in equilibrium. So in equilibrium, uh, this is a much easier problem. You're not doing this on the Keldish contour. You don't have the dynamical sign problem, but there are hard problems in equilibrium, multi-orbital problems, where you do have uh, a certain sign problem that is somewhat similar to the dynamical sign problem in nature. And in another project that I won't talk about today, we were able to show that inchworm can uh, largely overcome this in models with two impurities. And we have some three impurity problems now. So I, I won't go into detail about this, but this is just the Matsubara or imaginary time Green's function at three different temperatures. And as we go down to low temperatures, standard uh, uh, hybridization expansion quantum Monte Carlo breaks down. This is the red uh, stuff here, uh, but inchworm doesn't. And we do it for a model where we have an exact result and a model where we don't, essentially. Okay, so, so now that we've gone through the methodology a little bit, uh, I wanna talk to you about results. Uh, so, so let's talk about full counting statistics in the Anderson impurity model. So when we first did this, we just wanted to see that it gives the same result so we did this at the non-interacting limit, where we have uh, an exact uh, solution. And this is not trivial for the hybridization expansion because we start from the atomic limit. So it's a good benchmark and, and it works quite well. So essentially you see uh, this Z of lambda as a function of time for a few values of the parameter lambda. And you can see that the periodic on lambda is, uh, the dependence on lambda is periodic. So we take some values between minus pi and pi and that, that covers the whole regime. So, so that essentially tells us that it's same. And then we can take contour plots. So now this is time and this is lambda in that same range. And we can see a case where it's not interacting and a case where it's interacting. In this case, both of these have a voltage applied. And uh, the first thing you might notice is that there's not much difference, right? Like you don't immediately see it as being very different as you turn on the interactions. But what's interesting about full counting statistics is what you can extract from them, not the generating functional. Uh, so, 
one of the first things that I talked about is, is these uh, distributions. So distributions, uh, the probability of having the number of leads on the left lead change by delta n at time t, that can be extracted from the full counting statistics generating function by taking essentially Fourier components of it. So here's an example where we take the uh, zeroth Fourier component, okay, p0. So this is one minus p0 as a function of time in the insets and the big plots are uh, time derivatives of that, which is called the first passage time distribution. So on top, we have an equilibrium case. And what you can see is that as you go to long times, uh, the probability of having uh, an electron, the number of electrons on the left lead change uh, goes to about one half. So it's actually possible that it'll never change. So how can that be? Uh, well, when you're in equilibrium, in this case, you start the dot uh, either fully, uh, doubly occupied or unoccupied. Uh, both your leads are in equilibrium, they're half occupied. And essentially what you would want to do to equilibrate is to just move one electron into the dot. So that could happen from either the left lead or the right lead. So uh, that, that gives you about that probability of that one half. Either an electron will go from the left lead into the dot and then not much else will happen or one will go in from the right lead and then not much will happen on the left lead. Uh, now if you start in the magnetized state, uh, you can see that this decays very slowly. Right? This, this will go to one half eventually but very very slowly. And if you look at the derivative of this, it has some sort of long tail. So this is essentially the stabilization of the uh, local magnetic moment that you see in the condo regime. If I turn up the temperature, I can essentially kill that. And you see that you relax quite quickly from the magnetized state. If you're in the unmagnetized state, you can see in the probability distribution and the waiting time distribution, how uh, the magnetic moment is uh, uh, essentially stabilized. If you turn on a voltage, uh, any finite voltage, then essentially all of these probabilities will go to one at long times. And uh, you see a much smaller condo effect. So, so I, I won't go deeply into this because I want to show some other things. So, so that was uh, P0. You can also look at P1, 2, 3, and so on. Right? So this is the probability, that time-dependent probability that the number of leads, uh, electrons in the left lead has changed by one or two or three and so on. And here I'm applying a voltage, so it's not going to become negative, essentially. There's, there's almost no backflow. And I'm showing in dashed lines, non-interacting results, and in solid lines, interacting results. And what you can see is that the interacting result is always a little bit after the non-interacting result. So that sort of makes sense, because once you put an electron on the dot, it's going to repel the next electron. So what you can do to quantify this a little bit is look at the distance between two pairs of peaks here between two adjacent peaks in the non-interacting and interacting case. And that gives you a time scale uh, for something like the time between electron tumbling events, but at a single electron level. So in the non-interacting case, this just goes to uh, the inverse dot path uh, coupling, which is the only time scale that you can really have here. In the interacting state, state you see that it's larger. So you see anti-bunching, essentially. Electrons are repelling each other. You know, they have a Coulomb interaction, so that's not extremely, extremely surprising, but uh, it's pretty interesting to see that sort of level of single electron probabilities. Okay, uh, another thing that we did with this is look a little bit at uh, the geometry of the leads. So in a lot of systems for quantum transports, uh, you have uh, ways to tune the leads. You can control the density of states or the coupling density of the leads. And a lot of them, you actually have poor control of the leads and you would like to probe what's going on in the leads. You'd like to know whether you have a good connection and what type of connection you have. And uh, here we took just two very basic models of leads. Uh, so, so this is a 1D lead. You can uh, solve for the coupling density analytically. Uh, I also know how to do that in infinite dimensions. In any other dimension, I know how to do it numerically. Uh, and for the 1D case, when I change, the dot path coupling, essentially controlling the bandwidth, I can go from this wide band picture of the Coulomb blockade diamond, which I, I think most of you know. So this is the standard Coulomb blockade picture of transport. 
so and this is a current as a function of a gauge voltage and a bias voltage. Uh, so if I reduce the bandwidth, I go uh, past a series of these steps to a case where I have almost no transport because my band is very narrow. I don't have band overloads. Now, all of this is from quantum master equations. So this is a kind of a semi-classical approximation for this, which captures Coulomb locate quite well. And I'm taking parameters here, which are uh, commonly thought to be pretty good parameters for Coulomb locate, right? U is enormous. Uh, the condo temperature here is uh, minuscule. Uh, and the temperature is orders of magnitude above the condo temperature. So you don't really expect to have any strongly correlated effects. So this is very much Coulomb locate. But uh, what I'm going to do now is take some cuts across these distributions, essentially at the symmetric points. You have five the minutes. Okay. okay. And at this uh, other special point, okay, where, where these lines almost meet. And on the left, I show you the master equation result. On the right, that's the exact result from, uh, from our intro Monte Carlo. And you can see uh, immediately some differences. Okay? So even though we're normally in Coulomb locate, you see that this strong Coulomb locate that's predicted from master equations is, is very quickly broken. And that's because you have a large interaction. So you have large interaction induced broadening effects that are not accounted for in master equations. Uh, so that's, that's kind of nice. Uh, uh, as you go to the wide band limit, this gets better and better because uh, there's a Markovian approximation in master equations, which is good at the wide band. Now, if you go to the noise, you see uh, that this is a much more sensitive probe of interactions. So what you see is now there's a, a real qualitative difference in the noise between the master equation prediction and the exact prediction. Uh, you not only see noise immediately at uh, weak bias in this regime, which corresponds to Kondo, uh, you, uh, you see a, a pretty different dependence on voltage. In the opposite regime, right, which is you can think of as mixed valence, but it's basically. So you see that master equation predicts that thermal noise pretty much saturates. Uh, so, so you don't get a lot of extra noise or shot noise from voltage as you turn on the voltage. Thermal noise is really what sets the scale here. Uh, and you see that if you do the exact calculation, then thermal noise is drastically reduced and really things are rapidly dominated by shot noise. So this is quite nice. Uh, I'm looking now and seeing how, how these things change when you uh, change the leads. So this essentially explores bandwidth so far. And this, these are some preliminary results, still approximate of what happens when you go to the condo regime so here, temperature goes uh, down as you go up. Uh, you're still not quite in the condo regime, but uh, this top left plot is essentially a derivative of the plot that uh, David was showing earlier. Uh, and you can see the condo effect in the current here. But the interesting thing is that you can see condo effects of condo appearing in the noise a lot earlier at higher temperatures than you would expect. So you see signatures of condo above the condo effect. And we still have to verify whether this prediction is realistic. Another thing we did, and I really don't have time, is heat currents. So you can set a temperature bias across the junction. And then in addition to current in its noise, particle current, you can look at heat currents in its noise. And from those things, you can extract entropy generation. And in all of these plots, dashed lines are master equations, and uh, the x's are exact results. And we have sets of, right, and, and we, we keep the left lead temperature at a high temperature on these left sides and at a low temperature, the low condo on the right sides. So as we go to the right sides, the left lead is in condo. The right lead is maintained at, uh, is, is changed, right? The ratio between the left and right lead is made. So essentially, as we go to the right here, we're cooling the uh, right lead, but keeping the left lead at the same temperature. And uh, you know, one, one nice thing that you can see is that once you extract an entropy generation from these things, master equations give you completely wrong results here. Uh, but if you do the exact calculation, then you get, uh, you, you get the physical thing, which is that entropy generation will go up as you go up in temperature. And uh, okay, I think I'm basically out of time. So I'll just pull this up and uh, uh, I'll say that uh, we have a, an interesting method that's able to, to look at these things. Uh, 
I, I believe Olivier will show another method that is another Monte Carlo method that's able to explore these kinds of spaces, which has some advantages. And uh, we, we have done a lot of work on full counting statistics. And those of you who are interested in that are uh, welcome to contact us. So thank you. Thank you very much. So I don't know how to proceed with the question, but perhaps people can ask questions and I will repeat them. I don't know if you can hear them directly, so let's try. So, Jan. Yeah, I can hear you, but uh, not anyone else. Yeah. So could you could you hear the question or not at all? <laughs> okay. So at the beginning of your talk, you showed uh, a, a couple of curves. In one case, you had an exact solution, and in the other case, there was no exact solution. And I guess the question: is, Can you say in the question? How close are you to simulating the noise experiment? Are you talking about this slide or? Earlier, earlier slide, back, back, back. Oh, oh, this one, yeah. So, so this is a tough project. We, we've gotten pretty close uh, and I think that we can uh, uh, do actually most of this, uh, but we're not quite able to reach the Fermi liquid. It's really tough for us to reach the Fermi liquid. And I think that's a better regime maybe for some other methods right? that, that would really maybe be something for NRG or maybe for uh, Olivier's method. But uh, we, we really struggle to get this uh, five thirds. I think we can do it. It just requires an unreasonable amount of computer time. What makes that particular system difficult for you? Well, uh, you have to go to quite long times in order to get a converged uh, a steady state and the signals are small. So what is actually shown here is uh, uh, the first and third components, right? Uh, so so you, you have to expand the noise around zero temperature and zero bias uh, as a function of uh, uh, the voltage. Okay, so you have to take the uh, term proportional to V and the term, term proportional to V to the third. And you have to do that at very small voltages, which means very small currents. And that means that our signals are small. So for us to resolve this uh, is difficult. Are there other questions or comments? David? So I suspect based on what you said about the um, about the Fermi liquid case that this would not work, but uh, what if you extend this to uh, the two-channel condo uh, situation where if you send in an electron, you should send out a spray of electron pole pairs? So I don't know if you did. Yeah, I think I heard that one. Yeah, okay, good. So, so I'm not sure about the two-channel condo. I mean, first we have to, first we have to add an additional impurity. But uh, certainly deep in Fermi liquid regimes, we have a problem, but it's a question of what you're looking for. This particular thing is just a very small signal. It might be that something else is easier to measure. We can certainly see condo peaks clearly. Uh, we can see condo, fix, peaks, condo physics in many ways. Uh, this particular question about the noise is, is complex. Other questions or comments? Okay, if not, I have one. I mean, you mentioned that you can extend it to multi-orbitals and so on. Can you extend it to, uh, I would say, not zero D structure, like a chain, for example, or other systems like this between the reservoirs? So, uh, uh, so adding more impurities, adding more interacting yeah. sites is uh, exponentially hard in okay. this particular expansion, right? So we can't do more than two or three. Uh, we might be able to add something like uh, uh, like uh, leads which are Leninger liquid, uh, and this is a product a project that uh, uh, Moshe Goldstein, who uh, I was not supposed to be in this conference. Okay, yeah. 
and they are working on. Uh, but uh, yeah, in general, this is this is the kind of expansion where you really can only do impurities. What we could do uh, approximately is dynamical mean field theory. And then you could approximately treat larger systems, but, uh, but it's still impurity physics. Are there other questions? Yes. So can you repeat how you technically take into account the geometry of leads? Yeah, so the way that it works in inchworm is that the leads come in as a hybridization function. So these hybridization lines essentially are a function uh, delta of omega and t. Uh, of delta of omega and uh, some sort of site index. So what we do actually is we solve a non-interacting problem with the separate leads, which is very easy to do. And from that, we essentially extract the Green's function at this point, and that gives us all the information that you need in, all, in order to propagate the equations of motion. So we can take essentially an infinite number of uh, lead sites and any lead geometry as long as it's not interacting. Okay, unless there is a very pressing question, I think it's time to close the session and thanks all the speakers.